I've always been more of a beg forgiveness and ask permission kind of guy, and in some ways that's kind of the theme of this episode. So back in the spring of 2001, Punk's War, my debut novel, was getting ready to come out. My publisher, the Naval Institute Press, in its 130-plus year history, had not done that much fiction. In fact, Punk's War was only the fourth novel they'd ever done. The first one came out in 1984, a book you may have heard of, called Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy. The second one came out in 1986, another well-known novel by my good friend Stephen Kuntz called Flight of the Intruder. The third one by the late General Edwin Simmons is called Dog Company Six, came out in 2000. And then my debut, Punk's War, came out in the late spring of 2001. So about a month before the book is scheduled to be released, I sat down with the press PR director and started to go through what was going to happen once the book was published in terms of promotions and marketing associated with the book. And she laid out what the book tour schedule was going to look like and also mentioned that there would most likely be a lot of interest in this title because it was a novel from the Naval Institute Press and they would bill it as the next Hunt for Red October kind of thing and they expected there would be a lot of radio and TV. So I was okay with that, but I was concerned because I was still on active duty. I was a commander on the faculty of the Naval Academy. It was my last tour on active duty. And I had my retirement papers in, but I still wasn't retired. So I figured I should go over and sit down with the public affairs officer at the Naval Academy and talk about what the ground rules were. So I did that. I sat down with them and explained, hey, I have this book coming out. And they were telling me I'm going to do this and this. And so the PAO decided to bring in the superintendent's JAG, his lawyer. Again, I'm explaining, you know, they're telling me I'm going to do a book tour and there could be radio and television. And they kind of gave me this attitude like, aren't you a big deal? I mean, that was kind of the tone. And they explained that, okay, whatever. It's fiction. We don't really care. The ground rules are whatever you do, you have to do it on your own time, on your own dime, in civvies, and you have to make sure that they understand you're not a spokesman for the U.S. government. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm sure I can comply with that. And so that was it in terms of guidelines. So the book comes out at the end of May, and I start doing signings and events and speaking engagements at Navy leagues around the Mid-Atlantic, Alumni Association gatherings, I'm doing some press, newspaper interviews, some local TV and radio, and it's cooked along just fine. The book is selling well, the press is happy, and then a few months later, 9-11 happened. So I'm still teaching at the Naval Academy. We all remember where we were on that day. And so the landscape in terms of interest in the subject matter of Punk's War was increased many fold. So I'll never forget, I was on the sidelines of a Little League lacrosse game. My sons were playing here in Annapolis, and I got a phone call from Susan, the press PR director, and she said, NBC wants to talk to you. I'm like, okay, what do I need to do? She says, they're set up in one of the hotels downtown in Annapolis, and they're in this room, so go there at this time. So okay, they know that I'm going to be in civvies and not speaking as a representative of the government, right? She says, yes, I've told them that. Okay, fine. So a few hours later, I, I did that. I, I walked into this room that they'd booked, and it was full of camera gear. It was a regular hotel room. And they'd moved the beds and the furniture around, and it, lights and cameras and two chairs. And so I sat down with this correspondent, and just talked about 9-11 and what naval aviation's reaction was going to be. So I, I did say up front, I cannot speak on behalf of the U.S. government. So I'm just telling you what I know as a function of having flown airplanes for most of my career. You know, I'm currently not in a squadron. I'm on the faculty of the Naval Academy. So everything I'm telling you is not specific to any operations that are going on now. So I'm saying, okay... Strike warfare, this is the beauty of carrier aviation. You don't need host nation approval to launch airplanes, land airplanes. And I also mentioned, and this kind of became one of my main 
talking points as I did more and more media going forward. We were wondering what aircraft carriers were going to be for in the wake of the Cold War, now that the Soviet Union was gone. Here's your answer. In the face of an asymmetric threat and pop-up conflicts worldwide, thank God we have aircraft carriers that can go there and take care of business in a hurry. So I got a lesson in how this goes. I literally talked to this correspondent at NBC for a half hour, and I was on for about 10 seconds because I had told everybody in my family, hey, I'm going to be on NBC News tonight. And it was barely a blip. And in fact, they didn't even mention Punk's War in this interview. So I went back to Susan. I'm like, okay, that kind of seems like it was a miss. She's like, no, no, it was good. You know, just getting your name out there is good. I didn't hear anything from the public affairs shop at the Naval Academy, so I figured we're, we're good to go. I complied with the ground rules as we briefed them a few months prior. Now, a couple of days later... Susan calls me again. This time I'm, I'm at work in my office at the Naval Academy in between teaching classes. And she says, Fox News wants you to be on at this time. And I was looking at my schedule. I'm like, yeah, I, I can make that. So I said, where's the studio? He said, no, they'll, they're going to send a car to you. And so just tell them where you want them to meet you. So I'm thinking, wow, okay. Um, meet me outside of one of the gates at the Naval Academy. There's a little parking lot across the street, and uh, I'll see you there. So remember, this is not that long after 9-11. The Naval Academy is on high alert. So I'm dressed in a suit and an overcoat. I walk out of Gate 8, across the street, and get in a black town car driven by an Arab-looking guy. So the driver drove me downtown to North Capitol Street, where the Fox News studio is, dropped me off at the curbside, directed me to go inside. I went inside. Hey, I'm going to be on Fox News. They're like, okay, here's your, here's your pass. Fourth floor. Went up there, buzzed in, went to the green room. A few people introduced themselves to me, producers and other assistants, sat me down, gave me a bottle of water. Then it was time to get made up. So I'm in the makeup room, little powder, whatnot, and an assistant comes and gets me. And so she walks me through this series of hallways into this like very small room with no windows. And all I'm doing is looking at this lens. She puts an earpiece. She asks me, left ear or right ear? I'm like, okay, right ear. Puts in my right ear. Behind me is this graphic of the Capitol, kind of stylized. And a producer gets in my ear and says, hey, Ward, can you hear me? I said, yeah. And so he says, this is Jim, whomever, up in New York, you're going to be on with Shepard Smith right after we come out of break. Okay, you good? I'm like, sure. I didn't know what we we're going to talk about necessarily, and I don't see Shepard Smith. I'm just looking at a lens in this box. It was kind of unnerving. So you hear the theme music, dun, 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 and then the lead in, you know, the, the war on terror is continuing, and this is happening. And so for expert opinion, we have Ward Carroll, author of Punk's War, who's currently on the faculty of the Naval Academy. So that party foul number one, I asked him not to bill me as a guy on the faculty of the Naval Academy or associated with the Department of Defense in any way, but they did it. And so he asked me this kind of weird question about other side of the aisle and, you know, sort of politicizing it already. And I kind of stumbled. And I'm just thinking, you know, I had this out-of-body experience, like, you're screwing it up. Dead air is bad. And I was like, yeah, um, well, I, and he rephrased the question, fortunately. And then we were actually off and running. Again, restated that, thank God we have these assets when we were wondering what we were going to do with them after the Cold War and the Reagan era. And then it's over. I mean, literally lasted about two minutes. You know, thank you, Ward. And then they went on to the next thing. And the studio says, Okay, thanks. And boom, they're out. I'm a little bit dazed, like, what was that? I walked out and the assistant comes and gets me. And I'm like, well, how did that go? She goes, oh, I think it was good. Right? So there you go. Check the block. Done deal. Walk back out. Town car's waiting. Drives me back to Annapolis. Get out in that parking lot across from the gate. Walk in, show my ID. And walk back to actually my house. I was living on the Naval Academy grounds at that time. Shortly after that 
first hit with Shepard Smith, Susan Arjani calls me again. She's like, they loved you and they want you to be on like again. Can you do it again tomorrow? I'm like, what time? She tells me what time. I look at my schedule. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. So I start doing this like more and more frequently. And I get in this routine. They send me a car. I jump in the car. I'm in civvies, suit, drive to North Capitol Street, get out, do the hit, come back. I started being on like upwards of four to six times a week. And I actually did some days where I'd be there twice a day. I'd do a morning show and then I'd do one of the evening shows. Uh, one of the Fox News correspondents I was on with a number of times was Rita Cosby. And I very much enjoyed talking to her because we actually seemed to communicate in a linear fashion, which was a luxury. So here's an example of one of the hits I did with Rita. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld came out and said he would not rule out the use of ground forces, ground troops there on the ground. We obviously have special operations and special forces there in place, but a significant number. Do you think it's going to get to that point, and do you think that that will be effective and necessary? Well, I, I don't know if it'll get to that point. I think uh, it's fair for the Secretary of Defense to not rule that out. And I think there's nothing more to be read into that except we reserve the right to fight this war on any front at any level that, that it mandates. And, and uh, I, I think that that's, uh, he's trying to be as honest as possible uh, with that statement. What do you think of our strategy? Are we fighting to win right now? Well, right now I think we got sort of a run and gun to use uh, football parlance. Uh, uh, we're doing the thing we do well, this, uh, the war we fought since, uh, since Desert Storm, the war that my book deals with, uh, uh, the war of uh, a joint air co component command ass assigning targets and those being complied with by the forces and walking down a target list. Um, and then you've seen a little bit of, uh, of uh, a special ops component, a little surgical insert and extraction. That's, I, you know, I, I'm not sure it's ineffective at this point. And if, if it, as we do a assessment, if it demands a, a more robust uh, strategy, as you say, then I'm sure we'll go there. All right, Commander Carroll, thank you very much. And I enjoy the title of your book, Punk's War. Thank you okay. very much thank you, for Rita. joining us. So I was also on, and this was Halloween night. I'll never forget it. Halloween night, 2001, with Brit Hume. So this was my first time in the real studio. So again, courtesy car, this time it's at night. Drive in there, get there, go up to the green room. Britt comes in and introduces himself to me. This is the first time I've actually met one of the correspondents and been in the same room with, with one of them. I'm getting the pancake makeup as usual. He has a spray gun. So he's getting like the all over spray tan kind of thing. And we're just talking about, okay, what what is it we want to talk about? And he mentioned B-52 strikes. And he mentioned that they had some forward-looking infrared footage, and could I describe what we were looking at? I said, yes, insofar as my description is unclassified. And I said right up, remember, I'm here as the author of this novel, Punk's War, that deals with naval aviation, carrier aviation. I'm not here as a DOD spokesman. I'm not here as a member of the faculty of the Naval Academy. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. We got it. I, I said, I also don't know anything specifically about current operations. And he said, no, that's good. It's fine. So we go in there, get seated, capital lit up behind us. You know, it's the cool desk studio kind of thing. You know, and, and so this was kind of high pressure TV. This was a next level besides sitting in a box and looking at a camera lens. So let's just watch this appearance and I'll break it down on the other side. The U.S. air campaign against the Taliban is only in its fourth week, and some critics are saying it's not going well and suggesting a stalemate be it may be at hand. Once again, the question has been raised of how much can be accomplished from the air against a determined enemy fighting on home soil. For perspective on that issue and on the war in general, we turn to Navy Commander Ward Carroll, a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy, who joins me here. Commander, welcome. Nice to have yeah, you. Great, great to be here. Um, what's your sense about um, this air campaign? Air Force experts have been telling us, really almost from the beginning of it, that while it was being executed properly in terms of pilots doing their job and targets appear to be getting hit, that it was relatively mild and that it wasn't as intense or as intensive as it could be. What's your sense of that? Well, I, I think it's early for one thing in the campaign, and I think we need to remember that. Um, I think it's been appropriate to uh, the intel we had, and it's been appropriate to the situation we're in. Obviously, today with the B-52, 
uh, carpet bombing, we've ramped it up uh, to some degree. But uh, I, I think we've done uh, what we intended to do so far, and I think it's gone pretty well. Now, talk to me about um, this question of of these front lines uh, that, the Tal that the Taliban have there around Bagram, north of Kabul, around Masri Sharif, which are the two areas where they're sort of face to face with Northern Alliance forces, whom we at least. Uh, if we don't support them directly, we're certainly supporting them indirectly. Um, we'd like them to be able to move. How much can bombing do to pave the way for them? Well, I, it can do a lot. Uh, and uh, we need to allow the, the hit assessment from today's raids uh, seed and take hold and see what, we, what we've done. Certainly, uh, the magnitude of what, what you showed before the break uh, is, is, uh, is that's a robust uh, presentation that, uh, that they haven't seen, and I think that can do a lot. Can it do everything? Um, I, I don't know, and uh, I think uh, the Department of Defense has been pretty candid about, uh, about what they hope to achieve with air power, and I don't hear anybody that matters saying that this is going to be the end-all and be-all of this war. Well, I know, but there's no, as far as you can tell, though, no one is contemplating a large injection of American ground forces in there. So if the Talib, I mean, if the Northern Alliance isn't going to take these uh, positions and conquer territory, who is? Well, that's a great question. I, uh, you, I think you've, you've answered it with the, with the question. Yeah, somebody's got to. Um, when are we going to do it? Uh, Ill-defined winter. There are a lot of variables here. Uh, the thing about that is that is a step once you take it that you can't take back. And, and I think we're being very uh, protracted and, and uh, uh, not cautious, but being very uh, sort of uh, deliberate about how we go about doing Talk that. Talk to me about the psychological effect of this bombing. Two types, high tech, low tech. First, high tech. OK, if we could go to the tape real quick uh, that we have queued up there. Uh, uh, you know, we've heard a lot, Britt, about the uh, uh, how uh, invulnerable and, and this, this, uh, this classic Afghan countryside and the threat, and certainly the countryside is, uh, is uh, uh, daunting, and, uh, and uh, the Afghan warriors, uh, or the Taliban for that, uh, for in this case, have done a lot to uh, um, build this, uh, this mystique of, of, of how, uh, how dedicated they are and how they're willing to die, but uh, from that FLIR right there, you can see they've never seen this sort of uh, this strike what, what warfare that? What capability. What did that show us? Well, that's that's a Tomcat's uh, uh, FLIR that uh, What's is the FLIR, uh, the forward-looking infrared, right. um, the precision bombing pod, um, and right there, what did it, uh, hit? It, it looks like it's aimed at a uh, cave opening, and you can see uh, as the thing hits, you have a secondary explosion. So it was most likely uh, holding some munitions, and there may have been uh, some some Taliban forces in that cave, but. Certainly, if they think that they've seen this from the Soviets in the form of Heinz or whatever else, they're mistaken. And this cannot be lost on them, uh, what we're doing here. And, and I, I think... You mean, um, your, your point being that the Soviets had nothing like this? No, kind of nothing. Guided. No, they didn't have aircraft carriers that could project this power with impunity, with no concern for host nation uh, status. And they didn't have precision munitions capability that can target cave openings. Right. Now, again, can this win the whole war? Um, uh, unknown, but it certainly is doing something. You know, it's not it's not having a, a no effect. Now, let's go to the. Lo you, you mentioned that the, this was an awesome display, uh, uh, the B-52 carpet bombing, as it's called. It was done. What what is that like? I mean, I, I take it there's two effects to that. It's destructive, uh, uh, and that's part of it. Psychological effect of that. Well, I think it's incredible. I mean, uh, this is just hell on earth. I mean, how can uh, troops in the middle of that be other than persuaded that uh, that we're resolute and, and we're going to take it to them. You know, I I, uh, I think that's a very profound step that we've taken, and uh, and uh, I, this can't be lost on our enemy. And what would be the kind of th effect? Would you contemplate that they would would withdraw from those positions because they're vulnerable? I mean, how vulnerable is a dug-in enemy along lines in mountain country like that to the kind of bombing that, we described, that we've seen? Well, I, again, I'm not privy to the intel of, uh, of what we hit well, exactly. Just generally speaking. Well, if they're out in the open, uh, they're very vulnerable. If they're dug-in, then the vulnerability is subject to, uh, to assessment and, and then retargeting. Um, so uh, 
in, in any case, the uh, if nothing else, and I'm not saying that was all that was done, but if nothing else, uh, the morale factor is 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 uh, very profound here. And that's because the noise, the 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 the, the violence of it, the sound of it, you can't sleep. What's what's that? Everything, like? all those things, and the destruction of it. Again, the Soviet Union didn't have the ability to bring this sort of destruction to bear. Even the B-52 kind of way? Sure, yeah. They didn't have, they don't, they didn't have the stick length bombing capability that we have, you know. So this, this that you're seeing here, um, if I'm on the open plane there and I look up and see this happening, uh, you know, I'm going to think twice about my point of view, quite frankly. Yeah, it's awfully hard to tell at this distance exactly how big that explosion was. I mean, it looks, you know, I suppose when this is from many miles away, right. it looks relatively small. I guess if you're out there, it's... But that's just, just one of a shake. stick of many bombs, you right. know, that we saw just there. So, uh, you know, this has got to affect their, them psychologically. Now, does, is it your... Can you get any feel for what the plan is? I mean, the Pentagon is telling us that this, this war is on plan, that we're, that we're on course, that we're doing what we set out to do here. Um, there are those who say that maybe it's not going so well. Last question. Well, my feel for what the plan is, is uh, I know Admiral Stuff will be in pretty well, and, uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a fleet operator, he's a fighter pilot. Um, the plan is, uh, is underway, and uh, I think the American people should trust those that are executing the plan, you know. All right. Uh, Commander Ward Carroll, who I should also say is the author of a novel about an F-14 combat fighter. It's called Punk's War. Punk is the protagonist, the pilot. And uh, you can find that in your bookstore, Punk's War, by Ward Carroll. Thanks very much. Thanks. Obviously, although I was there not as an official DOD spokesman, in theory, I was still an active duty commander, you know, and so not working with Shinfo at this time, again, applying with the ground rules as articulated some months before, but in my mind, I'm sort of thinking, you're kind of out there with this one. But then I got my momentum. I actually got to say, let's go to the tape, which is kind of a bucket list, you know, being able to say that on live TV, um, was able to describe what Tomcat forward-looking infrared lantern footage looked like, again, all on class, as I specified. And at the end, Britt held up Punk's War so on a primetime show promoting the book. Again, I get back from that. I'm waiting for the phone to ring for, for somebody to say, what the hell are you doing, Commander? But phone didn't ring. So I'm like, oh, okay, I guess we're still good, right? I mean, I'm complying with the ground rules as told to me. As you can see, I'm on TV in civilian clothes. Now, you also saw that they billed me as Commander Ward Carroll, U.S. Naval Academy. And I went to the producer after that aired and said, okay, I told you not to do that. And they're like, yeah, we, we won't do that going forward. But of course, they like the idea of leveraging my street cred as a DOD sort of official. So they're, they're happy to blur the lines. I'm not happy to blur the lines. Um, but again, the phone doesn't ring. So I'm thinking, because I'm in civvies and they talk about Punk's War and I always caveat whatever I say with, I don't know any classified information because I'm not in a squadron right now. Figured we're okay. So I keep getting booked more and more on Fox. And I'm doing Patty Brown. I'm doing Brett Baer. I'm doing more Rita Cosby shows. I actually did Hannity and Combs one night, one time, which was the show bef before the Hannity show. In fact, uh, Combs has passed away. But it was sort of this two opinions. Hannity was the conservative guy. Combs was the liberal guy. And going into it, the producers are saying, hey, you're going to love Sean. He really is pro-military. And I wound up having a little bit of a discussion, borderline argument with him about rules of engagement, where he was going all tough guy on it. And I'm like, I'm teaching conduct of war as my day job. And so there's more to it than just kill them all, Sean. And then I heard the music coming on. I'm like, okay, they're, they're just going to shut me off here. And I wasn't terribly happy about that. So I did not have a great experience with Sean Hannity in spite of the fact they said he's pro-military. But again, great viz and the press director is super happy with uh, what happened on the backside of that. So we kept going. Now a few weeks after that, I'm actually on my way back to the academy in the town car when my cell phone rings 
And it's the public affairs officer at the Naval Academy, the same guy I talked to originally about what are the ground rules. And he says, where are you? I'm like, wow, that's a great question. I said, I'm coming back from D.C. You know, cryptic answer. I didn't say I'm coming back from Fox News. I said, I'm coming back from D.C. He's like, can you come by when you get here? I was like, can you tell me what the subject is? He's like, we'll discuss it when you get here. So hung up, I'm like, okay. So this PAO at the Naval Academy, who was a commander like me, same rank, had just gotten a terse phone call from the headquarters of the Office of Navy Information. And they were like, what is one of your faculty doing being on TV? I mean, by this time, I'd done countless appearances on some pretty high visibility shows. And just now, are they wondering why I'm being on TV? So I don't know what the trigger was at the Pentagon, but this PAO had been embarrassed that he didn't know beforehand that I was gonna be on that show that day, in spite of the fact that we'd had a conversation some months before about the ground rules, and in spite of the fact that I explained to him that I was complying with the ground rules as he had briefed me back the previous spring. So he's like, Chinfo's very mad. No, he said, the Pentagon is very mad. He said, also, the superintendent, Admiral Ryan, is very angry. So you need to go from my office over to the superintendent's JAG's office. Again, the same guy I'd talked to the previous spring, because he wants to talk to you. So I'm like, fine. So I walk across the hallway there in the admin building and walk into this captain, Navy captain's office. And he's like, so what's going on? Like, um, well, I have been doing a lot of appearances because, like I told you, the book came out and there's a lot of interest in the title. And now there's a lot of interest in naval aviation as a function of 9-11. So the press director has been feeling a lot of requests for me to come on TV, and I've been doing it quite a bit. You know, I'm clearing it with my boss over at the pro dev department at the academy. And I'm appearing in civvies, and I'm also asking him not to bill me as a Naval Academy official or a government official, and most of the time they do, but admittedly sometimes they don't. So what's going on? He's like, okay. And he pulled out a folder which had transcripts of every appearance I'd ever done on Fox. And he starts thumbing through them, and I can see there's things highlighted. And he goes, so the good news is what you've said has been, by and large, really great in terms of the messaging. I'm like, right? Why aren't the public affairs people doing this? You know, I'm out there telling the American public that thank God we have aircraft carriers and God bless naval aviation. It's like, however, Chinfo is not happy that you've been doing this independently and they don't want you to do it in your capacity as the author of this novel. So effective immediately, and this is, this is actually Thanksgiving week of 2001. So he says, effective immediately, we're telling you to cease and desist all public appearances. He also said, I'm not infringing on your First Amendment rights here. So let's be very clear about that. So don't go for that lever. I am giving you a direct order as a proxy for Admiral Ryan, three-star Admiral Ryan, to cease and desist. Now, if you fail to do so, we will potentially bring court-martial proceedings against you. He said, I know you have your retirement papers in. I recommend you do not hazard your retirement status and everything that will come after that. So I'm like, okay, I got it. Fine. And I walked out, and I called Susan Arjun. I'm like, pull the plug. And we had a number of things booked. I'm like, I don't even want to do any signings anymore until the dust settles on this concern. So that was it in terms of my post 9-11 military expert on Fox kind of thing. After the holidays, I did wind up doing some radio down in Norfolk, which was a very pro Navy market, as you might expect. And I did some signings down there and some other things. And I mentioned it to the PAO. He's like, yeah, that, that kind of thing's fine. So the dust had settled on the Pentagon's concern. So I also heard later from a guy who was on 
the staff of the Secretary of Defense, that Secretary Rumsfeld had actually seen one of my appearances on one of the TVs they had on the outer office, caught his attention in passing, and he commented that that was great messaging, and he said, congratulations to Chinfo for making that happen, which is kind of ironic in that they suppressed me being their spokesman, but whatever. Fast forward a few months, retired from the Navy, worked at the V-22 program for a few years, and then got hired to be the editor of Military.com, as I've mentioned before. A big part of my responsibilities at Military.com was to be on TV and radio as a military expert. And I built on the things I'd learned during the early on-air appearances on Fox News, particularly, post 9-11. Here are a couple of examples of what I did in that capacity, starting with I appeared on Fox America's Newsroom program with Bill Hemmer. Before I show this clip, let me just explain the way that this works. So this is the 24-7 news cycle. You know, this is what Ted Turner created with CNN in the early days. So the early part of the half hour is going to be your hard news. And this is assuming you don't have like breaking news where it's dominating the headlines. So the first part, current events, then you get into the more of the human interest and not time sensitive features. And so that's where I would appear. So the day prior, the producer for this show would send me a couple of news items and sort of go, hey, can you talk to these things? And generally I had awareness because I'm the editor of a major military website. And now I don't have a town car picking me up anymore, so I'd have to drive myself to the Fox office. They had a parking garage underneath the studios. Not hard to get to. And I do the, uh, the appearance. So I, I wound up doing things like this, which is this unmanned tank. So check it out. It's an unmanned ground vehicle. It's fast, it's agile, and it can, well, it can seek and destroy enemy targets all by its own. Military experts say it not only has the power to save lives, that it may remake warfare entirely. Uh, what's so special about it? War Carroll, editor for Military.com in the world. Good morning to you out there in San Francisco. The Ripshaw MS-1, tell me about it. Yeah, hi, Bill. Good to see you again. The, the Ripsaw uh, was demoed yesterday at the Army Scientific Conference in Orlando. Um, the Army hosts this every year, and there's sort of an all-call for computer software designers, scientists, inventors, uh, biochemists to come and, and sort of wow the Army with their capability. Uh, this, as you showed there, is an unmanned tank. Um, they can go upwards of 60 miles an hour. It has an M240 uh, on the top. It is controlled from a separate vehicle, a striker or a Humvee, uh, and it's controlled from another vehicle. Uh, the gun is controlled from another vehicle. Um, and so it makes well, the enemy's you, targeting problem uh, really tough. The way you describe it, it's like an unmanned aerial vehicle on the, only on the ground. And it uses a That's treader, exactly a track, and not wheels. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. And, and as we've seen with the use of the Predator and other unmanned devices, this is the, the trend that's happening both in the air uh, and on the ground and at sea. So uh, it is technology that will save lives yeah, you, and, uh, and, and allow us to fight wars in a, in a more effective I, I way. I apologize for interruption here. It's robotic, we know that, but how would you use it, practically speaking, in warfare? You, you would use it to go against uh, high-risk targets um, and to attack with rapid speed um, and uh, you'd use it anywhere you would use a normal tank these days. Um, it's just uh, the only thing you're limited by is the firepower of the ripsaw. You know, it only has at this time uh, a machine gun, um, but it can be used uh, anywhere. Uh, it, it really is uh, flexible in that how way, how and that's what makes it a great idea. How would you apply it, say, on the ground in Iraq today? Or could you use it in the mountains of Afghanistan? Sure. I mean, let's take the first issue. Um, if you're, say, going against an insurgent stronghold, um, and, uh, you know, there's a high risk of the, uh, IEDs along the way and uh, concentrated firepower when you get there. This is where the ripsaw would be a, a perfect uh, a platform for that sort of problem. And in the mountains of Af Afghanistan, like you're seeing right now on the screen, uh, this thing can handle rough terrain. So, uh, you know, it's a great idea. And I know that the, vice, the Army's vice chief of staff uh, was very impressed yesterday. Um, so we'll see what happens in the procurement arena. Um, but uh, this kind of capability is certainly something the Army is giving a, a good look at. Well, Carol, thank you for your time and explain us that. A great, an incredible video, too, to watch that thing. We've never had anything like that before. Ward Carroll, thank you for coming back out of San Francisco. Okay, Bill, good All to right. see you again.
So I also did some weird things that my wife gives me grief about to this day, robots, snakes, and, and vomit rays, and, and those kinds of things. So it was not hard news. It wasn't like what I was doing in the early days, post 9-11. But it was good for the military.com brand to be out there. Um, and it, you know, I, I did enjoy it. So after all of this, I still believe it's easier to beg forgiveness than ask permission. But just be advised that sometimes if you don't ask permission, you may get threatened with court-martial. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Before I let you go, let me give you a sneak peek at the covers for the reissues of the Punk Trilogy. So you can see Punk's War here. Let me show it to you bigger. So here's Punk's War. The second one is Punk's Wing. And the third one in the trilogy is Punk's Fight. So I like these designs. I think the Naval Institute Press has knocked it out of the park with these. Hopefully you feel the same way. I get kind of a 70s sci-fi vibe. I'm looking forward to the books coming out. This is going to happen late September, early October time frame. Stay tuned to the channel for specifics on that. All three will be available as a Kindle and an audiobook, you know, so stay tuned for that. In fact, here's one from the Wayback Machine. This is the original audiobook of Punk's War. Six cassettes, the format of choice. So we're going to digitize this going forward and we'll record the next books. Not sure who's going to do it. Maybe I will. Maybe my good friend Spencer Garrett will. We'll, we'll figure it out. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you want to help us take this channel to the next level, please consider being a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. Check the links below for official t-shirts, mugs, and actually where you can get Punk's War currently from the Naval Institute Press and use this discount code when you get to checkout. That's the cheapest way to get Punk's War right now. Cheaper than Amazon. So check that out. This is why we subscribe for this kind of information. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.